Hello, everyone. We will wait a little bit to start to give people more chance to come in. You're getting to watch the slides. There you go. We've got our slide up. And um, yeah, we'll, get, we'll give a few more minutes, or not minutes, but seconds um, before we start. All right. Well, I am very pleased to welcome everyone to the 2021 ELSCA VP Smith Distinguished Lecture. Every year, the College of Humanities and Sciences selects an outstanding professor to deliver a lecture to the VCU community about their area of study. And it is an enormous honor to be selected. And one of the highlights, I could, one, that, one that highlights um, academic excellence in our college. Today, we are lucky to have Dr. Ryan K. Smith from the Department of History as our 2021 lecturer. I just got a message that I'm echoing and I don't usually have that problem. So I'm not really sure what to do. Um, if someone can send me a note on what to do about it, I might be able to, to fix it. But in, in the meantime, I think I'm gonna continue <laughs> with this introduction. Um, okay. Oh, so some people say I'm not echoing. All right. So before I introduce Dr. Ryan K. Smith, I'd like to say a few words um, about Dr. Elska V.P. Smith, whose gift makes this lecture possible. Dr. Smith served as Dean and Professor of Physics at the College of Humanities and Sciences from 1980 until 1992. She also served as the Director of VCU Center for Environmental Studies, um, she has worked at the University of Maryland, Sacramento Peak Observatory, and the Goddard Space Flight Center at NASA, as well as serving in a number of organizations and being a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. We would like to thank Dr. Smith for her generosity and continued support of the college. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Another Dr. Smith. <laughs> Having the last name of Smith is not a requirement, though, for doing this lecture. But I love, I love that that is what is happening today. Um, Dr. Um, Ryan K. Smith is a professor in the Department of History who specializes in American religious history, material culture, and more recently, historic preservation. He is the author of three books: Robert Morris's Folly, The Architectural and Financial Failures of an American Founder. Gothic Arches, Latin Crosses, Anti-Catholicism, and American Church Designs in the 19th Century, and his most recent book, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City, Richmond's Historic Cemeteries, which explores the history and recovery of the bur burial grounds of Richmond, Virginia, through the lens of race, and is the subject of his lecture today. Dr. Smith also has expertise in public history, having worked at the Library of Virginia, the Winter Thermal Museum, and St. Augustine Historical Society, and the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument, among other institutions. And he helped develop the Postgraduate Certificate in Public History for VCU's Department of History. And just last week, Dr. Smith was awarded the 2021 Distinguished Teaching Award for the Humanities and Social Sciences, where his nominator had this to say about his teaching. Dr. Smith has distinguished himself in, in particular by his innovative teaching, exploring with students wholly new approaches to the study of his, history, as well as taking teaching out of the classroom and into the real world. We are very proud that you are part of the college. And um, so we are, and we're glad to be here for your lecture today. Everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Ryan K. Smith. Thank you so much, Dean Mallett. Uh, we have indeed seen a lot of each other lately. And I certainly appreciate the, the Dean's support and so many of uh, what we're doing here in the college and, and what I've been beneficiary of. Um, I also want to just 
acknowledge what an honor it is to be here uh, giving the, the Elsky B. B. Smith lecture. It's, it's, it's quite a program in the college's history. And so it's, it's incredible to be a part of it. Um, I wanna also thank the history department and my colleagues there for their ongoing support and, and helping nominate me for, for, this, for this lecture today. Um, a little bit more before I get into the material of my talk, I want to thank, you're going to see that I owe a great debt of gratitude in terms of the research to a wide variety of folks, and probably foremost is Lenora McQueen, who has collaborated with me on some of the research that I'll be presenting. I also want to thank Dan Maurer and Steve Thompson, Anna Edwards, and Jody Costi, who have really shaped my thinking on our topic today, um, Muzi Branch and uh, the East Marshall Street Family Representative Council has been instrumental in helping me think through these issues and archivists at the Library of Virginia and the Valentine and other repositories have, have supported this work and helped me move this work forward. So um, that's, that's my note of gratitude. Of course, I, there's many more that I don't have time to thank, but my tip of the hat and, and deep heartfelt gratitude to what they've offered this project. Um, I also want to say that today we're going to be talking about one of the most significant burial grounds in the United States. This grows out of my work, as Dean Mallett mentioned, in terms of Richmond's historic cemeteries. So today we're going to be looking at one in particular, um, one that has a direct connection to our institution here at VCU. And I'd like to show how historical methods can help us understand its past and its position in the present. I'd also like to extend that a little bit and consider its current predicament and its role in our changing memorial landscape that we've seen uh, so much drama and engagement in over this past year or so. But maybe first I could just say something about the nature of cemeteries, the importance and power indeed of graveyards and cemeteries. Um, as a historian, we recognize that uh, they're priceless sources for historical information, for genealogical information, where we just can't find those uh, ideas and sources anywhere else. There's a, a scholar, Keith Egner, who writes about it in a little bit more of a broad way and what we can learn from them and why they're so powerful. He writes, because cemeteries are such patently liminal sites, poised between past and future, life and death, material and spiritual, earth and heaven, they more than any other designed landscape communicate grand social and metaphysical ideas. And I certainly have found that true in my own studies. We should recognize from our vantage point here in Richmond, Virginia, how cemeteries have swayed political fortunes on one side and another. And then on a more human level, cemeteries have enabled mourners who were torn by loss to uh, be able to re-knit the social fabric in a certain way. And they certainly offer families and individuals a portal for communion uh, with their ancestors and with their own mortality. So, so important on so many levels. Um, I'm gonna begin to share my screen now and, and get into some of the material. Here's a view of the cemetery, the burial ground that we'll be talking about today which unfortunately does not have any markers on its uh, landscape. We're working to correct that, working to change that. It's at the corner of Fifth and Hospital Streets on the north side of Richmond. But in terms of the overall power of cemeteries, maybe a, a more concrete example comes from uh, across the street in Richmond's Shaco Hill Cemetery, which was founded by the city in 1822. Um, and we get one early example of a marker there. This is the marker over the grave of Jane Steeth Stenard, as you read here. She died at 31 years old in 1824. She had deep roots in Virginia. She was born in Richmond to a prominent clerk, married uh, an up-and-coming lawyer, Robert Stenard, and lived in a lavish home with a large family on Capitol Square. Um, but aside from her marriage and census and death records, really the, the most substantial, prominent personal legacy she leaves to us is this particular grave marker. At the time of her death, this was one of the largest in any 
of Richmond's cemeteries. It's a quite ambitious marker. As you see there on the left, it has this large pedestal neoclassical shape to it. It has a, a symbolic urn on top. It almost looks like a human style figure with that urn as the head and it's about head high. So it has this sense of European formality and permanence. Um, it's inscription, as you can see on the right, a uh, very long inscription celebrating her role as a daughter and as a beloved wife and probably written by her husband, Robert Stenard. Uh, her, his, her, the widower's words just pour forth in this inscription. It's, it's almost like a, a, run -on, a big run-on sentence. He's just uh, coming forward with all of this, this grief and emotion. And so he touches, as you can see there, on um, grace, purity, gentleness, piety, virtue, it helps encapsulate or represent for us some of the, the highest feminine ideals in that society in the 1820s among uh, white Richmonders at the time. Um, and so this inscription, her husband's words, the artistry of the monument, the shade of the surrounding trees in this formal cemetery set a really dramatic scene for remembrance. And that's extended even more. Um, here we are in Zoom. And so if you need to move your Zoom windows around or your uh, other things so you can see it at the bottom, you can see that there's a little plaque that the Edgar Allan Poe Museum placed there. Uh, Red, Edgar Allan Poe paid tribute to Jane Stenard in his poetry. One of his early poems, To Helen, was, he said, inspired by Jane Stenard's beauty. And so there's a, a clip of his poetry at her bait at the base of her monument. And then also when I happen to take this photograph, you can see a pretty recent rose that was left on her grave. So it shows a lot of this recent activity uh, as a site of memory. And then across the street from Shaco Hill Cemetery where this monument is located, we have Hebrew Cemetery, which is still around today. It was founded earlier than Shaco Hill in 1816. Uh, by the Beth Shalom congregation here in town. And we're looking at the grave sites of Isaac Judah and his mother, Abigail Judah. Um, Isaac had been a prosperous merchant in town. He was the first reader of that Beth Shalom synagogue. The rounded headstones that we see here would have been very fashionable at the time. And I think we can see in them the negotiation on the part of the Jewish community between um, what made that community distinctive in terms of its religious practices and also more general themes. And you can see that literally in the split with the Hebrew inscription on top and an English inscription below. In his will, Isaac Judah asked to have the usual, he called it the Hashkaba, the Hashkuba, uh, prayer litany said um, upon his death. And he asked for a suitable tombstone to be placed over his body. He says, quote, that I may remain undisturbed and ask the same for his mother. So we believe that those both of these were procured at the same time by the Judah estate. Uh, you can see at the top, there's little initials in Hebrew that uh, stand for Po Nikbar or Po Nitman, which is short for here lies. And then in the English inscriptions on the bottom, uh, Isaac Judah's inscription frames his birth and death uh, dates in the English and in the Hebrew calendars, and concludes with the traditional Hebrew prayer, may his soul repose in peace, amen, and the same for his mother, Abigail. So both of these sites that I've just showed you uh, are still available to us to visit at the corner of Fifth and Hospital Streets, um, providing us with multiple entries into the region's past. They're both listed on the National Register of Historic Places, very significant in terms of our overall history. Um, but for most of their histories, they adjoined an active cemetery that was at the other corner of Fifth and Hospital Streets on the north side of town. And this is what we're calling today the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground that I will be talking about for the rest of the time today. This, as I said, is centered at Fifth and Hospital Streets. We'll look at some early maps in a minute, but if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing out the first two acres that were initially set aside across from Hebrew Cemetery or what would become Hebrew Cemetery and what would become Shaco Hill Cemetery. And then you go on to see in the shading of this outline what we think are the projected boundaries 
that that site expanded to. It would grow to encompass perhaps 30 acres or more containing roughly 22,000 burials of enslaved Richmonders or free people of color. And uh, it was active from 1816 to 1879. Uh, that stretch of time, the number of burials, its scope makes it one of the largest burial grounds for the enslaved in the United States. So again, this is a nationally significant site. And so today in our life in Richmond, we've been reckoning with its erasure from the landscape and an attempt to return it to that memorial landscape as we've seen our overall Richmond landscape revised in so many ways. And so this is um, Lenora McQueen who we'll hear about in just a little bit, her projection of the historic boundaries of the site. But let's start with the end, one end at least of the site. Um, here on the left is an internal city memo showing us examples of the erasure of the site from memory and the landscape. Uh, that memo from the city uh, parks and recreation director was sent to the city manager in 1958. And in it, the parks and rec director asserted that, quote, there doesn't seem to be much documentary proof that the corner of Fifth and Hospital Streets was used as a cemetery. He did acknowledge that there were memories of burials there, but he said, quote, again, we found no reason to believe the space had been used for burials, which hopefully by the end of our talk today, you'll see is just an appalling statement to make. Um, on the right, we see the newspapers echo that view. The Richmond News Leader in 1959 reported that this site would be rezoned, sold into private hands since, quote, records fail to disclose whether it was ever used for the purposes for which it was designated as a burying ground. So these decisions, this casting or recasting of the site's history was purposeful. We can retrace those steps and we can certainly establish uh, the falsity of those claims that documentary proof uh, exists to establish its use. So let's start at the beginning. If we go all the way back to 1815, there in the Library of Virginia, we can look at the ordinance books for the city council, or the equivalent of the city council at the time. And I've put a little star, a little blue star next to the pertinent language. And so I'll read from it. The, uh, the city council passed an ordinance that year in 1815. They were responding, and this is an important point, to protests from free people of color in the city who were unhappy with conditions at the initial African burial ground in Shaco Bottom. They were advocating for a better site. And so the city finally addressed those concerns. And here in this ordinance, set aside two acres of land on the city's Northern boundary, one acre whereof, in quote, shall be set apart for the internment of free persons of color and the remaining acre to the internment of slaves. And indeed in the bottom right of your screen, again, if you need to move my the window around a little bit to see it, the Richmond Inquirer repeated that the following year, announcing on the following up on that ordinance that this new public burying ground was gonna be laid out in terms of those two acres contiguous to the poorhouse, which I'll say a little bit about in a minute. And the keeper of the poorhouse would have uh, basically oversight of the graves and the layout that would continue there. So we can go on from the, this documentary evidence of its founding and look at the earliest maps from its uh, origins to show it to us on the landscape. Now, the first thing, this is a big plot of city owned land on the north side of town, away from the bustling business district along the riverfront. And the first thing the city built was a poor house that you can see in the left of this 1816 plot. Um, the poor house, uh, was set up for the indigent, for the elderly, and uh, they knew that this was going to be a site of burial grounds. And the first one that they set up in this neighborhood is over here, the one acre on the left, as the uh, inscription notes, for the burying ground for free people of color, and then on the right, for the burying ground for Negroes, so-called. Um, and it would be across from the Jews burying ground, as noted on the map from the 1817, the very next year on the right. 
And what would become Shaco Hill Cemetery, you can see it designated there very clearly, the burying ground for white persons that had not been set up yet. So a bit of a neighborhood cemetery district anchored at first by this Afri second African burial ground in the city adjoining the poor house, um, also near Bacon's Quarter Branch. And so Bacon's Quarter Branch was a valley that ran down the, the northern portion and the eastern portion of that hillside that fed into Shaco Creek. They also moved a powder magazine and a gallows nearby. So in that map on the right, you can see the city magazine for uh, gunpowder placed directly across what would become Hospital Street, there Marshall Street, from those two acres set aside for people of color in the city, free and enslaved. Um, we see it again 20 years later on this Bates plan of the city of Richmond. And there we see the, the Jews Cemetery or what would become Hebrew Cemetery still in place. The burying ground for white persons has been renamed the new burying ground. And the name, notice how the name has shifted here to the graveyard for free people of color and for slaves. That grave site had also extended, it looks like eastward, down towards some of those creeks and tributaries for Shaco Creek. Um, so this informal name would plague the site in terms of its uh, claims on the landscape or its stability and public memory throughout its use. Um, we can see another map here from 1848 that helps you see where it is in relationship to the city. Um, it's easy to identify the state capital and Capitol Square at the bottom of this 1848 map. The south of that would have been the uh, James River and the shipping district. The Shaco Bottom and the older African burial ground would have already been repurposed there just to the right of, of Capitol Square. And then up Shaco Creek, we find our poor house, the Shaco Hill, cemetery or the white portion of that burial ground, Hebrew cemetery. And then you can see what it's called on this map, on, its, on the legend of this map, it's called the burying ground for colored persons. What strikes me is really significant because they had then collapsed those distinctions between free people of color and the enslaved. And so now it is just commonly known on these maps as the burying ground for colored persons helping to construct this, again, idea of race in the city. Um, later maps, 1853 would call this the African burying ground. Newspapers in 1855 would call it the colored burying ground. And then city directories after the Civil War would call it the African cemetery. So um, it had expanded shortly after this map was made in 1848. Two years later, uh, the little dot there is the city hospital. Um, for smallpox patients and others, and the city enclosed about nine acres at least as an expansion of that initial burial ground that was already, as we saw, expanding itself. So African burials, African American burials taking place across Hospital Street along the edges of those hillsides and moving towards the back of even of Hebrew Cemetery. Um, so continuing to expand. Now we keep these uh, elements of the site in mind and white predations on the site, disregard of the site in terms of a, a place of sacred qualities or uh, legitimate memories in the city uh, by the evidence of grave robbing there from the very beginning. Um, in 1832, this is the earliest recorded example that we found of people preying on black graves for use as anatomical specimens. And here we see even before the Medical College of Virginia is set up, the keeper of the poorhouse told city council within the last six months, not less than 16 persons have been disinterred in the burying ground near the poorhouse appropriated for the colored population and paupers. And then he goes on to say how uh, there's a network there to supply the University of Virginia to receive a compensation for procuring that body and then shipping it up to the University of Virginia for anatomical study in their medical school. When MCV was founded with the opening of Hampton Sydney College's medical department in 1838 here in Richmond, uh, that practice only deepened. Uh, 
the new school, MCB, would announce that the supply of subjects for its dissecting room was ample, it said, since, quote, from the peculiarity of our institutions, material for dissection can be obtained in abundance. And uh, our historian Jody Costi in the Health Sciences Library has done tremendous work uh, on that practice. She's found that, quote, the school strategically placed two medical students at the almshouse or the poorhouse right there in order to collect anatomical materials. The Dean's account book documents a partial payment to Dr. Mayo to honor a debt owed by him to the students at the almshouse for anatomical materials. Now this was against the law. The General Assembly did pass a law about this time prohibiting the violation of graves, the violation of sepulture or the removal of any human body from the grave. But the toleration of this practice offers a really defining signal of the dehumanization of enslaved residents, of their treatment as a commodity rather than as a person. And as I said, that grave robbing took place at the site over the course of its history. There in 1888, towards the end of its life as an active burial site, the Richmond Dispatch reported, when the colored paupers and others were buried on the hillside north and east of the Hebrew cemetery, they generally fell into the hands of the resurrectionists. That ground was used for more than 50 years, and of interments made in recent years, very few skeletons will now be found in the graves. So uh, an appalling practice, but we do see dignity and tradition represented in the site, invested in that site by the Black community. And one of our best sources of evidence for this comes from a Northern traveler, uh, landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted, who was touring the South to report back to a Northern audience on what he found in terms of the effects of slavery on the South. So in 1853, he found himself in Richmond. And uh, one Sunday afternoon, he tells us, I met, this is his words, a Negro funeral procession and followed after it to the place of burial. There was a decent hearse of the usual style drawn by two horses. Six hackney coaches followed it and six men mounted on handsome saddle horses and riding them well rode in the rear of these. About 20 persons, male and female were accompanying it on the sidewalk. There were no white people. So Olmsted sees this procession. He's curious about it. He follows along. And so he describes where it is passing out into the country a little beyond the principal cemetery of the city, Shaco Hill Cemetery, which he has good things to say about, the hearse halted at a desolate place where a dozen colored people were already engaged heaping the earth over the grave of a child and singing a wild kind of chant. Again, he's not a southerner. He doesn't understand what he's hearing. So this is his words. Another grave was already dug immediately adjoining that of the child, both being near the foot of the hill in a crumbling bank the ground below being already occupied and the graves apparently advancing in terraces up the hillside, an arrangement which facilitated labor. The newcomers setting the coffin, which was neatly made of stained pine upon the ground, joined in the labor and the singing until a small mound of earth was made over the grave of the child. And so in that portion of the description, we see the care with which the community was taking to arrange that site, that very challenging site on the, on the hillside. Um, and then merging with that other funeral that was already taking place. Then he points to a leader stepping to the head of the grave, and after a few sentences of prayer, held a handkerchief before him as if it were a book. And I'll pause there and just notice that it was against the law to teach enslaved people to read. And so this was a fairly uh, radical gesture to make um, a gesture towards literacy, towards holding a book. And he pronounced a short exhortation. His manner was earnest and his tone solemn and impressive, only occasionally breaking into a shout or kind of howl at the close of a long sentence. I noticed several women near him weeping and one sobbing intensely. I was deeply influenced myself by the unaffected fine feeling and the simplicity, natural rude truthfulness and absence of all attempt at oral decorum in the crowd. So he doesn't understand what he's seeing and he is in a position to feel privileged to look down on this group somewhat or to, to not see 
the, the traditions that they are enacting there. But even then, Olmsted feels himself moved by the emotion of it and by the feeling of it. Um, the leader concluded by throwing a handful of the earth on the coffin with the usual words, slightly disarranged, and then took a shovel and with the aid of six or seven others proceeded to fill the grave. An another man had, in the meantime, stepped into his place who raised a hymn, which soon became a confused chant in Olmsted's words. The leader singing a few words alone and the company then either repeating them after him or making a response to him. So he's describing call and response. He's describing African spirituals that did not follow along European American style of singing and music. So we see the survival there and the, the nurturing of specifically African and African American traditions to celebrate this kind of a spirituality at this important moment at the turning point of this, these folks' lives. Lastly, a man had in the meantime gone into the ravine nearby and now returned with two small branches hung with withered leaves that he had broken off a beech tree, which were stuck one at the head, the other at the foot of the grave. And then he goes on to conclude that no one seemed to notice my presence at all. There were about 50 colored people in the assembly. So here we see how graves, some of them at least, may have been marked. Um, trees, indeed, could be symbolic. They could represent family. They could represent life. Uh, and it represented, at a minimum, um, what was available to this community to make a, a, a marker for these types of graves. There were other folks who recorded a few marble markers that remained on this site as well. So we know that there were stone markers as well as these more improvised wooden markers at the site. Um, one year earlier, before 1853 and 1852, when an enslaved woman in the city was hung at the gallows, very close to the site, if not on it uh, exactly, it was on this hillside adjoining what they called uh, the uh, colored person's burial ground. Um, one journalist recorded a, a black witness to that execution and then the burial at the base of the gallows as saying, she has gone home which again tells us the meaning that uh, was invested in the site. Now we see further white engagement with the practices there uh, through an incredible source found by Lenora McQueen related to her family history. We'll talk more about her momentarily, uh, but here we have a letter from Elizabeth Fisher, wife of a prominent mill owner here in town, writing a letter to her sister, in 1857, describing the deathbed scene of her family's longtime enslaved servant, Kitty Carey. And so Elizabeth writes, I stayed there and had her neatly prepared for the tomb. It was what she would have done for me. She has on the chemise or the shirt which she had asked you for some time since for that very purpose. I intend following her body to the grave tomorrow afternoon. I intend, and so does Jane. We do not intend any respect shall be spared to one who was ever faithful and affectionate. The few and only words she was able to say in the way of comfort when she saw her own children weeping around her bedside were these, don't cry children, don't cry for me, I am going home. And we know that following her body to the grave tomorrow must have meant the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground. The Fishers lived only a few blocks away. And this was, again, the primary site for the burial of the enslaved from 1816 to uh, 1865 after emancipation uh, at that point. Um, we recognize, even though these are heartfelt words, that this grief that Elizabeth Shirley felt was enfolded within relations of mastery that structured both of their lives through the grave. And incredibly, Lenora has also found further reflection on Kitty Carey's gravesite. Um, this was a poem written by a white Northern woman who was working for the War Department who had recently arrived in Richmond uh, in April or, or May of 1865 and publishes this poem titled Kitty Carey. And so look at how she commemorates this burial site. No marble tells where Kitty Carey sleeps, only a simple slab of painted pine. Time stained and worn, her poor memorial keeps 
one brief and half obliterated line. So near the highway that the yellow sand from passing wheels falls thickly on her grave. So this author, Percy, she understood the uniqueness of such memorials to the enslaved and how soon they would fall away. The poem goes on to say, for nothing guards her humble place of rest, the straying cattle browse above her head. And yet she does in this poem celebrate Kitty Carey's individual dignity and the importance of her memory at this moment, this national moment of emancipation. The poem concludes, lo, in the wind the blossomed sweetbriars stir and scatter fragrance round her resting place. So there we get a look at Kitty Carey, one individual burial there. We find other individuals buried at the site from a very few precious surviving interment registers, or at least quarterly reports indicating the burials, the interments that took place in this site from 1862 to 64. There were a few composite general numbers given for interments before this time, uh, but we don't have these individual entries like uh, we've been able to discover in the archives here. So again, this historical method helping to open up a site that's very difficult to engage on the modern landscape. Uh, these registers show the relationship between white and black portions of the Shaco Hill burying ground. Um, they also show them under the same keeper, as well as the broader entwinement of black and white lives in the city. So look how it's set up here. We've got the list in its words of colored interments near Shaco Hill burying ground for one quarter ending July 1st, 1862. You've got a column for the date, a column for the names, their ages, their diseases or causes of death, and if they were enslaved, the names of their owners. These were separated out by sex. So on the left, you have those of males. On the right, you have those of females. And if you break down uh, what we can learn about this in the month of May, for example, of 1862, we see 27 males ranging in age from three months to 45 years, all enslaved except for William Freeman. And then curiously, what are noted as prisoners of war, free colored prisoners of war. Um, 15 females were interred that same month of May, ranging in age from four months to 72 years. All of them enslaved except for Barbara Ann, who had died of a hemorrhage. Um, Molly was the oldest among them who died at 72 years old of pleuric pneumonia. Leading causes of death that we see here are typhoid fever and consumption. The average age of death was 17 years old. But I return again to these names uh, that are so rare uh, for us to be able to access. David Couch, uh, Jacob, Tom, Braxton, a man, a child, Henry, there's William Freeman, and then among the women, Ida, Nancy, Lucy, Molly, Fanny, Dilly, Kitty, others. Now, the Medical College of Virginia appears on these surviving records as under the owner's column. It's not clear whether the Medical College is the literal owners of these enslaved folks, uh, or that they were just responsible for sending over uh, for burial uh, these individuals. But there in 1862, you can see Bob, who died at 30 years old of typhoid pneumonia, sent from the medical college. In 1864, you see Reuben, you see Anderson, both sent over from our medical college. We see Eliza, or Elisa, 14 years old, sent over from the medical college. Frank, a disease of the heart at 15 years old, sent over from the medical college. And so I propose that this site demands our engagement, our reckoning from our own institution to follow up with. Um, as far as reckoning the numbers of internments there, we saw just a few 1862 to 64 itemized internments, individual internments. And uh, we've been able to either through projections or those through few numbers that do survive. And this is an incomplete list. I just took a few examples of years over the life of the site to show us um, the black burials that we can account for to show how we arrive at that 22,000 number. 
The most important element to see on that, I think, is that the internment numbers are basically comparable for the black burials in that African section of the Shaco Hill burying ground and the white burials in the Shaco Hill burying ground or in Shaco Hill Cemetery. And so those numbers are basically corresponding with one another, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. And uh, the estimate for Shaco Hill Cemetery for white burials is 30,000 overall. I think that that 22,000 number that we've been able to project for African-American burials in the Shaco Hill African burial ground is probably conservative. Um, and so this is how we try to reach those demographic estimates for internments there. I should say that after 1866, uh, these numbers are solid for the 1870s. These, these are um, authenticated from the newspapers and other reports, whereas some of the earlier ones, say from 1823 or 1829 to 1831, we have to just offer um, projections. There has been a demographic analysis of the death rates as applied to the population of black residents in Richmond. And that, that demographic analysis also points to roughly 22,000 deaths in the city, most of all of which would have been directed to this particular burial ground among the black population. So after the Civil War, uh, we see a map from 1876 here and it shows us an expanded ground. This is after emancipation, when black uh, residents had more of an option, more an available choice in where they wanted to be buried. And most of them chose burial in another site. And so here this becomes known as the Potter's Field, which is the rough name for a graveyard set aside for paupers and the poor. So its name changes yet again, and you can see the extent of it grows down to the bottom of the valley to Bacon's Quarter Branch, uh, as well as further to the east. Um, this expanded site would ultimately fill up in the eyes of the keeper. Shortly after this map was made in 1877, the superintendent of the nearby Shaco Hill Cemetery said, quote, that portion of the cemetery allotted to the colored poor is by its locality and arrangements, being an unenclosed field, illy fitted for a burial place and its now overcrowded condition renders it impossible to make any internment therein without disturbing some previous burial, making it both repulsive and inhuman. And so he recommended opening up a different site. And indeed, this was closed in 1879 and pauper graves among African-Americans were sent to Oakwood Cemetery at that date. So this begins a shift in the outcome of this site. It had been actively used up until 1879. But we want to focus here on the obliteration of the site. This is a technical term really used by cultural geographers to distinguish the effacement of a site's associations in contrast, say, to sanctification. And we can see here a number of steps that led to its obliteration, all basically at the hands of the same New South coalition of government officials, city engineers, and private developers who were engaged in the creation of the city's Monument Avenue during these same years as a way to blend commercialization with the lost cause triumphalism that we see uh, for political ends. So in 1865, the Confederates evacuating Richmond exploded the powder magazine that uh, uprooted a number of graves in the area, building new powder magazines. They uncovered upwards of 100 skeletons uh, on this site. Hospital Street was rerouted through the cemetery. Fifth Street was extended through its Western boundaries in 1883. At the time, it exposed a number of bones in the process of that street extension. Black voices, including city alderman Josiah Crump, were raised in protest, uh, but the workers nevertheless used, quote, some of the dead bodies and bones to fill in the grade of the street. Another severe attack on the site took place in 1890 with the development of the Fifth Street Viaduct or the bridge to the Highland Park suburbs across the valley. In 1900, the railway was placed at the bottom of the valley. And then we see portions of it sold off or transferred off to the Hebrew Cemetery Company, enabling Hebrew Cemetery itself to enlarge between 1880 and 1910 at the expense of uh, the Shaco Hill African burial ground. There were black protests raised in that process and we see here John Mitchell writing in the Richmond Planet in 1896, the ongoing persecution of those Barton Heights cemeteries across the valley was done, quote, at the instance of people who profited 
by the desecration of the burial ground on Poor House Hill, North Fifth Street, when graves were dug into, bones scattered, coffins exposed, and the hearts of the surviving families made to bleed by the desecration of the remains of their loved ones. And so this reminds us how Black Richmonders were engaged in a battle to protect their graves in other burial grounds or to uphold new burial grounds that would succeed these. And it also reminds us of the overall social pressures that this community faced in a number of fronts during the Jim Crow period. The only photographs of the, that we have of the site in the 19th century are these two. And you can see in 1887, this hilltop, this knoll uh, of the hillside, which down its banks would have been those African-American graves during the life of the site stretching around behind the almshouse, which you can see in the distance in those graves of Hebrew and Shaco Hill Cemetery. But notice how this hilltop has been leveled for street fill and other infrastructure projects only three years later in this photograph from 1891. So a quite gripping visual example of the uh, removal of some of those uh, plots for fill and also the construction there of the viaduct across the valley. Um, it dropped off of the map about the early portion of the 20th century. On the left, you can still see that potter's field recognized in the 1905 city directory, but the next year in 1906, we see Hebrew Cemetery and Shaco Hill Cemetery, but we do not see the potter's field recognized any longer on that map. Um, Fifth Street Viaduct was rebuilt in the 1930s and renamed the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Bridge in 1941. There we get the sign. And now we're back to the beginning of the talk where we saw the city making moves to uh, sell off these parcels. And so in uh, 1960, they sold the original acreage to the Sun Oil Company, allowing for the construction as we can see there, that Sunoco station that would ultimately be called the Tally's Auto Center. And so this is a view of the modern site today. That's the remains of that Sun Oil Company station, Tally's Auto Center, um, the original core of that, what would become a 30 acre burial ground. Recovery efforts start somewhat in an indirect way here at VCU with the discovery of that well on East Marshall Street outside the Egyptian building, where the remains of 53 individuals were found, primarily of African descent, that were able to be dated back before the Civil War, between 1840 to 1860, almost certainly stolen from grounds like the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground, if not it itself. And so the East Marshall Street project was launched in 2013. Uh, and then following that, a family representative council was assembled to help uh, right some of the wrongs in the initial discovery of those remains and disregard of those remains. And so those remains have been returned to Richmond in a formal ceremony in 2019, as we see them brought into the Department of Historic Resources. Uh, so again, these may be examples of remains from the, the site that we're talking about today. The site also entered popular memory with Veronica Davis, a historian, her pathbreaking book published in 2003, Here I Lay My Burdens Down, A History of the Black Cemeteries of Richmond, Virginia. And she had a section in there telling the story of the Potter's Field. So again, a, a really useful pioneering study. And then Lenora McQueen, who has been an incredibly tireless activist for the site and researcher who has helped us understand its full scope Kitty Carey was Lenora McQueen's fourth great grandmother. And when she visited Richmond in 2017 and discovered where she was likely buried, she visited the site, was distressed at what she found, thought her GPS was, had led her to the wrong site. It took her some time to process what she was seeing. She says, if I had to sum up my feelings about seeing the site into just one word, it would be disturbed. I'm very disturbed. It makes me very sad. It also makes me angry and I feel somewhat horrified. For all I know, my ancestor ended up on the dissection table and from there possibly in the well at MCV. I hope this is not the case, but it is possible. The feeling of excitement that I should be feeling for figuring out where my ancestor is buried is overshadowed by all of the other feelings. And so this galvanized Ms. McQueen into action. She saw that the parcel here owned 
earlier by the Talley family, 1305 North 5th Street, was up for a tax auction by the city in 2018. She mounted a lobbying effort and the city was able to reacquire that historic core of the site in 2020. She helped put together a group to write a National Register of Historic Places nomination for a historic district that would view the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground as a contributing site uh, and therefore be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. That's gonna be up for review at the Department of Historic Resources in March. So we've got uh, hopes that that will transpire. Um, and she advocated for this site on a number of other fronts. We see on the right that some of the ongoing threats to the site. Interstate 64 is on that Eastern boundary of its historic extent. And there's plans to widen I-64 that would further intrude on the burial ground. There's also a DC to RVA plan for a high-speed rail. And the initial rail plans as you can see in those uh, light colored lines, would have intruded on the historic boundaries of the site. Um, the firms and agencies responsible for putting this plan together believe that the burial ground lacks, quote, subsurface integrity and therefore does not contribute to the site's overall eligibility for the National Register of Historic Places, and that the project will have no adverse effect on this resource. But recently, I'm happy to say that Section 106 historic preservation process has been reopened. So there may be a new determination of that in the site's future. And also we've seen just this year, Preservation Virginia list the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground as one of its 10 most endangered properties uh, throughout the state. And there's a photograph of it right there among the other properties acknowledged. There's another related challenge, how do we memorialize it today? How do we get signage? How do we engage the community in the history of the site? We can point to the African burial ground in Shaco Bottom as one way to do that. This was a site that predated the site that we've been talking about today. And in 2011, the state helped transfer it from a VCU parking lot to the city, where now it has a role to play in the commemoration of Shaco Bottom and in terms of its African-American history. There's been an incredible engagement with the site. There's historic signage up. And so the uh, initial African burial ground uh, provides us with one model uh, and an evolving model on how we can engage with the site. Up in Alexandria, there was a one-time effaced site from 1869 where 1700 uh, runaways, free people were running uh, to freedom during the Civil War immediately following. 1800 or 1700 were, were buried on that site. It too led to effacement in terms of a gas station and highways, but those were recovered and removed. And now you can see the new signage and new memorials that were dedicated in 2014 with a central sculpture and with relief panels telling the history of the site. And then lastly, in New York, the New York African Burial Ground dedicated as a national monument uh, in 2006 with this memorial that we see here opened in 2007 at the site where over 400 uh, burials and in, uh, interments were re human remains were recovered and studied and then later reinterred on the ground itself. And so uh, I'll conclude here today by uh, keeping these possibilities for what we would look to see at the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground today. We've seen so much change in the memorial landscape, the addition of the Maggie Walker statue, the rumors of war monument outside the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Emancipation and Freedom Monuments on Browns Island, the, the Jackson Project and Jackson Ward. And so the Shaco Hill African Cemetery, excuse me, the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground is a critical element uh, of this changing landscape. We're celebrating the progress of descendants, working with the city and the state to recommemorate it. So on the left, you can see here what may be the first official signage that goes up. It's uh, being planned to be installed a state historic marker um, next year in 2022. Um, and so while its history throughout its uh, period of, of its afterlife has been denied on many fronts, we're finding here that the archives and descendants can help us push back uh, uh, on its erasure. Um, meanwhile, our VCU community has an opportunity and a duty to reckon with its past here. The eyes of the nation and those of the descendants are on us. Um, more 
about its relation to other burial grounds in the city and beyond can be found in my, my recent book there on the right, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City uh, that Dean Mallet had mentioned. And so um, I, I point to these important gra grave sites as sites of potential rebirth for us in our community and beyond. So thanks for everyone's attention. Um, I went on a little bit longer than I had intended to. And so I know that uh, there's not much time left, but I'd be happy to take any feedback or any questions uh, in the time we have remaining. Thank you for your talk. It, I, and I appreciate the call um, to action that you conclude with, which I think is probably a strong feeling you had as you did this research is thinking about what our responsibility is. Mm -hmm. So Alexis, I know you're monitoring the questions. Yes, yeah, so we just got a nice compliment in from <laughs> Dr. Carolyn Eastman. She just said, what a beautiful story and so beautifully told. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, any other questions want to come in? I can say back to Dean Mallett's point about action and engagement. Uh, you, you're right, I absolutely was thinking about this as I was going along. And I, I think that in my book and in this particular story, there's something about graves, right? People might disagree about how we tell American history and what the emphasis can be on, but the sacredness of human remains, it should be central to us all. And so I think the stakes for sites like these that connect to human remains offer us perhaps an opportunity to engage with that history in a way that can be more comprehensive, that can be uh, cut across divisions that might appear in other places. And so to me, that's what I kept thinking is that almost anybody that might not ordinarily find themselves an advocate for you know, some elements of our history could always grasp the importance of treating graves with respect, anybody's graves with respect. And so it's, it's a really critical part of, of our memorial landscape. We just got a question sent in. Um, what is the best way to get updates about future plans for the site? Well, if I could plug just a little bit, my www.richmondcemeteries.org has a news section on it where I do try to provide updates as to what's going on with not only that, but other of the burial grounds in the city. And I've got a number of updates on, on this particular site there. Uh, but also I'd encourage folks to write to our Virginia Department of Historic Resources to support uh, placing this on the National Register of Historic Places. As I said, there will be a, a public meeting, looks like sometime in March, where people will have an opportunity to weigh in either there at the meeting or beforehand through written comments. And so uh, the, the State Historic Preservation Officer, Julie Langen, I'm sure is open to receiving any kind of support or feedback uh, that we can offer to move the site further into our commemorative landscape. Um. And Lenora McQueen is here in the oh. chat and she said, um, and I think you kind of touched on this just now, but is there anything else that people can do to provide support to the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground? Oh, uh, well, I look to Lenora for all the cues as to the best way to make this kind of support. Um, she has done so much for this site and it shows us how really one person can make a difference. One person can make a difference here. And, and Lenora, I think anybody who's engaged with her has seen the kind of energy and passion and authority that just one person can speak with. And so she has written to the governor. She has written to our uh, state department heads. She has written to the mayor, the city council, and her letters have made a difference. Uh, and so I think looking to our political leaders, Lenora, and, and the model that you've provided for us, just asking for help. Lenora asked for help from Preservation Virginia, asked for help from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, asked for help from the Historic Richmond Foundation. And these have been good partners for us. They have come, they have answered those calls for help and they've, they've done wonderful things to support this work. And so I, I look to Lenora's model in just not being afraid to ask for things and to demand things and to reach out to our press and hope that our newspapers and our publications and our media are continuing to call on this. And frankly, also our institutions, you know, I'm just a very small cog in the big wheel of VCU, but I do feel like VCU, um, we, I'd love to hear other voices as to what VCU might be able to do to recognize its historic ties to this place and to raise its profile and, and try to address some of the many wrongs that has been done to this site. 
Yeah, Lenora wrote in again and she said, writing a letter of support to DHR in support of the nomination is a wonderful way to help. So, great. Yeah, and specific instructions on how to do that are under my little news blog on the richmondcemeteries.org website. And Dean Mallet just put it in the chat for everyone who's looking. So you can link onto that. And then we did have one other question. What is the correlation of the Shaco burying ground to the cemetery on Magnolia Street where Maggie Walker is now buried? Oh, great question. So the short answer is my, my book does treat that one. I think you're talking about Evergreen Cemetery where Maggie Walker is buried. And that's right next to East End Cemetery. And so the larger story that I didn't really get into today is this sequence of this pattern that happens over and over in the city where you have a burial ground set aside for or built by the African community, the African American community, and then it constantly having to struggle for its claims on the landscape. So that initial African burial ground being covered over by Interstate 95 and parking lots, this burial ground being sold into private hands to be used as a gas station, the Barton Heights cemeteries across the valley founded by free blacks in the 18 teens, um, closed down by the city and then basically uh, blocked access to, to black commemorations. And then the next generation, the generation of cemeteries founded during the period of freedom, post-emancipation, like Evergreen, like East End, like Woodland Cemetery, those, as we see right now, are struggling for their survival. They've been uh, overgrown, they've been vandalized, they've been starved of resources. It's only now that we're beginning as a, as a state, uh, as a polity, to address some of those changes. And so this is a structural problem. And maybe one other thing folks could do to help address the many stories that are unfortunately like the pattern that we see here that I've tried to describe today, it, there is a, uh, a proposal in Congress right now to create a historic African-American Graves Network Act to try to bring a systematic approach to all of, almost every single community throughout the South and beyond have these historic African-American graveyards that have been, uh, at the receiving end of infrastructure projects, of desecrations, of being sold into private hands, of so many challenges. We can point to many others around the city of Richmond. One was recently suggested to be turned into a site for the casino, uh, one of the proposed casinos on the south side. And so there has to be some kind of a larger, more coordinated effort to so that it's not just individual grassroots groups trying to fight against larger institutions along the way. So I think writing to our uh, congressional representatives. I know Donald McEachin has been one of the co-sponsors of that bill for the Network Act. And so it would be great to show our, our, our congressional representatives our support for, for bringing some resources to bear on the problem overall. Great. And someone asked about a recording of the talk uh, available online, and we will have a recording of it available on the CHS website. Um, and also, if you're a faculty member, it will be in the next newsletter. So faculty and staff, it will be in the next newsletter. So, and Dr. Smith, I know we're up on time, but there's some really great compliments in the chat and in the Q&A if you didn't get a chance to see those. Um, and, yeah. Everyone, I've been talking about cemeteries now for quite a long time. And so I appreciate everyone's good graces to uh, continue showing up and offering me your, your thoughts and your feedback and your critiques and your support. So uh, that, that kind of support means so much to me. And uh, again, I, uh, I'm just so grateful to be here and appreciate it all. Yeah. Well, we are glad that you're part of our college community and that you're doing this important work and bringing attention to the issue, helping to elevate it along with the other folks who are in the community doing the work. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, we will we'll send the recording out for everyone to share in, in the coming days. Great. Thanks everyone. Take care.